Aconteció en aquellos días que se promulgó un edicto de parte de Augusto César que todo el mundo fuese empadronado. Este primer censo se hizo siendo Sirenio gobernador de Siria, e iban todos para ser empadronados, cada uno a su ciudad. Y José subió de Galilea, de la ciudad de Nazaret, a Judea, a la ciudad de David, que se llamaba Belén, por cuanto era de la casa de la familia de David, para ser empadronado con María su mujer, desposada de él, la cual estaba encinta. Y aconteció que estando ellos allí, se cumplieron los días de su alumbramiento, y dio a luz a su hijo primogénito, y lo envolvió en pañales, y lo acostó en un pesebre, porque no había lugar para ellos en el mesón. Había pastores en la misma región, que velaban y guardaban las vigilias de la noche sobre su rebaño. Y he aquí, se les presentó un ángel del Señor, y la gloria del Señor los rodeó con resplandor, y tuvieron gran temor. Pero el ángel les dijo, no temáis, porque he aquí, doy buenas nuevas de gozo, que será para todo el pueblo. Que os ha nacido hoy, en la ciudad de David, un Salvador, que es Cristo el Señor. Esto os servirá de señal, y hallaréis al niño envuelto en pañales, acostado en un pesebre, y repentinamente apareció con él el ángel una multitud de huestes celestiales que alababan a Dios y decían Gloria a Dios en las alturas y en la tierra paz, buena voluntad para con los hombres. Sucedió que cuando los ángeles se fueron de ellos al cielo, los pastores se dijeron unos a otros, Pasemos pues hasta Belén y veamos esto que ha sucedido y que el Señor nos ha manifestado. Vinieron pues apresuradamente y hallaron a María y a José y al niño acostado en el pesebre. Y al verlo dieron a conocer lo que se les había dicho acerca del niño. Y todos los que oyeron se maravillaron de lo que los pastores les decían. Pero María guardaba todas estas cosas, meditándolas en su corazón. Y volvieron los pastores glorificando y alabando a Dios por todas las cosas que habían oído y visto como se les había dicho. Feliz Navidad. Man, we appreciate all of our families that have participated in the reading of the scriptures uh, this Christmas season and this morning was the Colombo family. Uh, just grateful again for them leading into this. Now, what we're going to do is take seven of those verses today for our text. And I just want to take the first seven verses and kind of unpack that again as we ask the question through our series, Why Did Jesus Come? This is not about what happened on Christmas. This is not about who was involved in it, but it's why it happened. Before we jump into that, I got to tell you something that happened to me this week. So I'm going through Target. I'm in Target doing some last minute Christmas shopping. I just needed to pick up a few stocking stuffer items, just a few little things. So I'm in there late one evening and I'm walking down this aisle and uh, this lady sort of, sort of uh, sees me coming and she just looks at me and just stares at me. And I'm like, I don't know if I know this from this lady from church. Is she from Grand Point or whatever? Sometimes people do that. And then they're like, hey, Pastor Lawrence. And I'm like, yeah, I, what's your name, right? But um, we, I, we, neither of us said anything. So we just walked past each other. Uh, I went my way. She stayed there in the aisle. But then I saw her again in the next aisle. The same thing happened in the next aisle. She went around the corner. I went around the corner. She looked at me and smiled but didn't say anything. And then we met again over in the grocery section. I mean, she was grocery shopping. Again, I was just picking up one item. But she looked at me and just kind of smiled again. And, but I didn't think a whole lot of it until I went to check out. It was kind of late. There were only two registers open. So I went into the shortest line, which is what you always do, right? And wouldn't you know it, right in front of me was this lady with a cart full of groceries. And she's loading them onto the belt. And so I'm standing there just waiting for her, unloading her groceries, and then she gets down to the bottom. She had this big case of water, and it was kind of heavy. She was struggling with it. So I reached down and just took that case of water out of her cart and put it on the belt. And when I did that, she looked at me, and she recognized me, and she's like, oh, my goodness, I owe you an apology. And I'm like, for what? And she said, well, for staring at you, just staring at you like, like I did in the last couple aisles. And I, she goes, but let me, let me explain why I did that. She goes, I have a son, a grown son, who looks just like you. And this past year, him and his family were moved out of the country on business. And she goes, I don't see him very often, and now that it's Christmas, I just really miss them. And then she said, I want to ask you a question. 
And I don't want this to be odd or weird or anything like that, but she said, would you, like, just give me a hug and say, I love you, Mom. <laughs> and I lied, and I said, that's oh, not weird at all. Come on over here, right? Just... And, and, you know, like if I had a mom out there and some strange guy would offer to hug her, I just want, I'd want him to do that, right? Yeah, right. And so I hugged her and said, I love you, Mom. And then she was done checking out at that time and everything was loaded in her cart. She turned and took the cart and, and just left. And then I, you know, come and I check out my stuff, my few things, and the guy says, that'll be $352.15. I'm like, What? He goes, yeah, he goes, your mom just said that you'd pay for her groceries as well. <laughs> now, that would be a really, really good story if it were true. <laughs> but it's not. I just made that up, and I'll tell you in a moment why I did that. <laughs> uh, some of you are ready to throw things at me right now. I understand that because you're caught up in it, right? You got it. You're like, this is the Christmas spirit, Right? Tears running down your face. Others of you were halfway through that story. You're like, I don't know about this. You know, your skepticism meter runs a little bit high, kind of like mine does. And you figured out halfway through this that this is not right. This is probably when, you know, she asked me to give her a hug, right? That's when you're like, this is not true. Others of you, you know, you're like, this, this just didn't make sense at all. And here's the thing. A lot of us come into this place, right? And we know the Christmas story. We know the Bible. We grew up with this, and we accept it just as it is. We hear things like the virgin birth and Christ being born in Bethlehem and being born in the stable, and we don't even question it. But for somebody out there that's maybe hearing this story for the first time, they're like, I don't know about that. There's too many unrealistic things in the Christmas story that kind of make that skeptic a believer, right? Right? They don't want to believe it. And maybe there's someone here today, and you're not quite sure yet that everything in the Bible is exactly the way that you, that you think it should be. Maybe you're not thinking yet that God is really who he is. And there's some skepticism in your minds because your experience doesn't necessarily line up with this. What I want to do is talk a little bit about that today because we're asking the question, why did Jesus come? And I think the reason that we're talking about that we'll discover today is going to help us answer some of these questions. Remember, he came to give us hope. He came to give us uh, trust. He came to give us courage. And today, we're going to unpack and unbox the fourth reason why he came. And we'll get that to that in a moment. Let me read the scripture to you from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, and then we'll work this message. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to their own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. And he went there to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So this really is the culmination of how Jesus came to be with us in this world 2,000 plus years ago. And you take this, you take this part of the story, and you combine it with the fact that Mary had a child before she was even wed. I'm in this culture. Mary and Joseph were not even wed. And this looks like a, a story of poor planning. This looks like somebody just didn't plan very well. Actually, uh, you know, here's Mary uh, being, being with child before Christ, before Christ was born. And, and if God were going to send Jesus into this world on a rescue mission to reconcile you and me back to him, don't you think that he would do things a little bit differently? We even talked about this last week. We talked about why Jesus did the things that he did and the fact that it takes a lot of courage to accept this. But today I want to take this even a step further. If, the, if Jesus really came on this rescue mission for you and me, why did he come in some kind of a grand and a glorious way? Why would he choose Mary and Joseph as their parents? I mean, here's Mary uh, is, is just this young teenage girl, and Joseph is this carpenter from Pond Bank, right? <laughs> Nazareth, actually, but it's kind of like Pond Bank. I hope I didn't offend anybody with that. If you're from Pond Bank, I love that little town. 
But it's kind of this no-name town. Jesus didn't come in any kind of a, a status into a, a popular place. At least, why wouldn't God wait until Joseph and Mary were married until, until he carried this out? And why a road trip when she's nine months tre- pregnant? I mean, remember, Mary's not kicking this in an Escalade. She's riding a donkey. And so this whole thing, and then there's this whole thing about no room in Bethlehem. Remember, this is the hometown of Joseph. Don't you think that there would have been somebody or someplace where he could have crashed for the night if this was his hometown? And then there's the feed trough. Now, I know that we've upgraded that to a manger a little bit, but it was a feed trough. I grew up on a farm, so I know what a feed trough is like. It's not like it's a totally disgusting place, but we don't run it through the dishwasher every night either. And this is where Jesus was born. This is where he was chosen to be born. Now, in in all these humble places. Now, in the Greek culture, the Greeks taught that under no circumstances were you ever to humble yourself. They taught that to be humble was a sign of weakness. And so when they heard things like this, like Christ, uh, the coming of the Messiah, laying his head in a place where the cattle had just eaten their dinner, they would not have believed it. They wouldn't have believed it because this doesn't fit with, with humility. But that is exactly why, uh, the, the way that Christ came. So here's the question. Why did God choose to do it this way? If this was God's way of bringing a wonderful counselor and a mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace into the world, don't you think that there would have been a number of other ways that he could have done this that would have been more effective? See, if I were God, and I think we all would agree that you're glad I'm not, but if I were God, I would have changed things up a little bit. I would have had Jesus born in Washington, D.C. I mean, that's... That's not, not Pond Bank, right? But in Washington, D.C. After all, D.C. needs a little Jesus anyway, don't they? Now, that's not a political statement at all. All I'm saying is every one of us needs grace and truth uh, into our lives. So whatever place we're in, we need that grace and truth. Or maybe if we stuck to the Middle East, I would have him born in Rome. I can imagine Jesus graduating from Rome High. Right, he has the jacket and everything. He's going to go places because he came from a popular high school. He could get into any college. He had all the resources there of, of Rome and, and, and all that. Or how about we even go to the, the spiritual, the religious capital of the world and say, have, I'd have him born in Jerusalem, in the temple. I mean, then everyone would have believed that he was uh, the Messiah. Or what if he were just born into a different family? Just a different family, a family with a big name, a family with a lot of resources, a family that has a lot of influence, a family that perhaps would have this military that would back him in his ministry. But he had none of that, none of that at all. Why not a big spectacle in a big town? See, the way you make an entrance says something about you. I love going to weddings, and one of the parts that I love about weddings is that time between the wedding and the reception. When the bridal party is getting ready to come into the reception, right, they make their entrance, and the DJ announces their names, and they come in, and they do the hoot nanny, or they do the floss, or they do the ride the pony, or something like that. They make an entrance, right? And so the way that you and I make an entrance makes a difference. This afternoon, there's going to be two NFL teams entering Lincoln Financial Field. And they're going to be entering to their fight songs and their uh, fireworks and thousands of fans cheering them. One of the teams will leave kind of the same way. The other one will be the losers. (laughs) And I have two Cowboy fans sitting right up front here. But anyway, whether you're entering a sports arena or a wedding reception or whether you're coming into a job interview, first date, or just entering a room of people that you've never met, the way that you make an entrance is important. But here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to see in this Christmas Sunday is how God chose to make his entrance into this world. And why did he do it this way? Why did he come as a little baby? Is it because God doesn't know how to make an entrance? I don't think so because he knows how to make an exit. If you go over to Exodus or Acts chapter 3, Jesus just walked out of a tomb and now he's gathered with a bunch of disciples and a whole lot of other eyewitnesses and all of a sudden right in front of them, Jesus just lifts up and he makes this ascension, disappears into the clouds. Right after he gave them the great commission, he disappears. Jesus knows how to make an exit, so if he knows how to make an exit, 
I think he also knows how to make an entrance. So why did he come the way that he did? That leads us to the age-old question, and that is this. If God has the power to do something, why doesn't he do it? If God has the power to do something, why doesn't he do it? Have you ever asked that question? Uh, Maybe you've thought that question. If God is all-powerful and God can do whatever he wants to do, then why doesn't he do something? Or why at least doesn't he do it right? So maybe your family or you have been through something this past year, and it has caused a lot of things going on in your lives, a lot of deep trouble and heartache, and you've been praying and asking God to do something different, but he didn't. And you're asking, well, if God is all-powerful, then why didn't he do this? Or maybe then there were some moments when you said, you know, God, if you had the power to do something about this or to change something or the ability to intervene and keep something horrible from happening, then why didn't you? Why didn't you? God, if you could have kept my spouse alive or my child alive, then why didn't you? God, if you could have saved my marriage or kept my wife from walking out of me and my husband from walking out of me, then why didn't you do that? And we kind of do it with this almost a a, a fist-like thing. God, why didn't you, if you could? God, if you could remove my anxiety, if you could provide for me financially, if you could just get me a new job, then why don't you do it? See, if God can do everything that he wants to or anything that he... I mean, mean, the scripture even tells us that with, with God, all things are possible. So why doesn't he do things? Here's the tension for many of us. Here's the, here's the thing. We want a God who is powerful enough to intervene in our lives when we want him to, but not so powerful that, that, that he would intervene when he wants to because we still want to be in control. We want God to work for us, but not when we can control things, right? God is kind of that, that, that plan B for us. In other words, we want a God who do, only does what we want him to do, but not what, what he wants to do in us. Because a lot of times what he wants to do in us is a little bit uncomfortable for us, or a lot of uncomfortable. And let me just respond to all that by saying this, God does not want to control you. God does not want to control you. God will not force his way into your life, but neither will he abandon you. See, this whole thing about Christmas is God with us. Emmanuel, God coming with us. See, God came to have a relationship with you. And that is the fourth box, a relationship. We want to unpack the fact that Christ came to have a relationship with you. He did not simply come as a dictator. He did not come to to kind of just tell you what to do. He came to be able to have this this relationship with you. And this relationship is not some kind of a, 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 a touchy-feely, hallmark kind of an exchange, but rather it's a relationship whereby your life and your significance is determined. Without a relationship with the living Lord, you really won't have any direction in life. You really won't have any significance in life. But with that relationship, you'll have both. You'll have a life that is abundant with purpose and meaning. You'll have some direction for your life. And not only that, that relationship that Jesus Christ came to give you could also change your destiny, your eternal destiny. Christ came so that we might get to know him in a relationship so that we would know him as a savior, not just as a big God out there somewhere, but as a savior who lives inside of us, is close to us. Uh, I remember... um, uh, when, when, when Moses was told to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, God came and said, Moses, you're, you're the guy, right? I want you to lead him out and uh, lead them out. And Moses said to God, he goes, God, why don't you show me your glory? Show me how this is going to work. Give me a little bit of, of you know, advance notice on how this is going to look. And God said to Moses, Moses, listen, you can't see my glory. No one can look at the face of God and live. See, God's glory and God's majesty and God in who he is is so big that if he would have come in that way and presented himself as God in all of his majesty, you and I most likely would not be able to relate to him. It's it's just too much. God said to Moses, listen, I want you to hide yourself right here in the cleft of this rock, and then when I pass by, I'm going to put my hand over the opening to that rock so that you don't become overcome, so that you're not overcome by my glory. But then after I'm passed, you can look, you can look, and you would see the back of me. But God says, no way can you see my face and handle this. 
And I'm just wondering if the reason that Christ came as a baby was so that he could relate to us because you could not relate to a God in all of his majesty. I love what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. He says, now since we have a high priest, a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable, watch this, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted just as we are, yet without sin. That's because he came in human flesh. That's because he came as a baby. He didn't come as God in all of his majesty. I'm in a sense he did, but he came in the form of a young child so that he would be able to grow up like we did and go through the things that we did and be tempted with all the things that we're tempted with and understand us and sympathize with us. That's what it means for God to have a relationship with us. He did it through his son, Jesus Christ, who knows exactly what you and I are going through. That's why he can relate to us. What that is saying is that we have a Heavenly Father who came down to our level, who came down into our world and understands everything, everything that we're going through, everything. He's been through all the emotions that we go through. He's experienced all the pain that you and I feel. I mean, He gets it. He gets it. It's a God that you can have a relationship with. And that's why He came in the human flesh. That's why He came with common parents. That's why He hung out with farmers and fishermen. That's why he connected with tax collectors and political leaders and religious leaders, people just like us. He came so that we could have a relationship with him, a relationship of trust. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Would you find it easy to trust a God who remained in heaven but just barked out orders or gave you directions? Probably not. That would kind of be like someone someone telling you how to raise your kids that never had kids, right? Or would be like me sitting on the edge of my recliner today telling Doug Peterson, the Eagles coach on the sidelines, how to run the team. Although I could probably give him a little advice, or sometimes I think I could. But see, God came so that we could relate to him. Not some distant deity, not some guy far off someplace just barking orders into our world. He came right here to be with us so that we would understand. Or would you, would you trust a God who is just waiting to condemn you? A God who is waiting to punish you, just ready to pounce on you with some kind of a, a, a rough life? No, you wouldn't trust that kind of a God either. Would you trust a God that perhaps doesn't understand or even care about you or can't relate to you? You know, be like God is not just looking down on you saying, you know what? I see what you're going through down there. I see that you're going through a hard time, but I'm up here. And you're down there, so I really can't help you. You wouldn't trust in a God like that, would you? I mean, we wouldn't. So God said, listen, I want want you to be able to trust in me because it is the absolute best thing for your life to put your trust in me. So I'm going to send you someone. I'm going to send Christ into this world so that you can can identify and relate to him or, or, or to me through him. And that's why he gave us this way. It's like Isaiah said, it is a God who came to be with us, who laid down his crown, took off his royal robes, and entered into human flesh. I'm going to go out on a limb here this morning and assume that everyone in this room had a human birth. Am I safe with that? Good assumption. Everyone had a human birth, that messy, painful birth, right? And God said, that's how I'm going to send Jesus. Because I don't want him to be lost on you. I don't want this to be lost on you. So I'm going to send him into the world with a messy, painful birth so that it's just like what, every, everything that we experience. I, I don't want the Savior of the world to be lost, but I want the world to know, I want the world to know him, so I'm going to send him in a way that they can relate to him. So when God entered this world, he didn't go big. He went small. He went small. When God entered this world, he came in a way that that you and I could relate to and me in every possible way. Now, I can't stand up here this morning and pretend uh, to tell you that I know all the reasons why God does things the way that he does. I can't do that because God is this mysterious kind of a person. His ways are not our ways. I can't even pretend to tell you that I understand everything in full confidence the way it happened in the Christmas story. But I do know this. 
I do know that God himself often, ma- often makes himself so small that he can get into our lives because when he gets into our lives, he wants to do some very, very big things. And so he comes small and works his way into our lives just like he did at that first Christmas day. He came as a baby into this world so that you and I could relate to him so that he can do some really, really big things through us. That's what it means to have a relationship with Christ. Now, let me also say, when this small baby came into this world in this insignificant way, he still came as big God. Big God. Don't you ever think that Christ in you is something very, very small or insignificant just because of the way Christ came. Christ came in a small way so that, you could ent- so that he could enter you and have a relationship with you, but he's still big God. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But He came in a way that allows us to have that relationship with Him. So I'm wondering if there's someone in this room today that has an idea about about God that is, is not relatable. Maybe you think that God is the big man upstairs. I mean, that puts him in another level, another category, another room. He's the big man upstairs. Oh, and he's big because he controls this world, right? He does a lot of things in creation. So he's a big God upstairs, and he's there if I ever need him. And so I have a problem in my life. I might be able to call out to him. He might hear. He might not. But he's there, right? So maybe that's your image of God. Or maybe you do have that image of God as someone who's just kind of waiting for you to do something wrong and then bring something horrible into your life or something that's that's kind of punishable into your life. But here's the way I want you to see God today. I want you to see God not as someone that is distant, not someone out there barking orders to you, not someone that's waiting for you to do wrong, but someone who loves you so much that he has come to be with us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us, a relatable God, someone that you can have a personal relationship with. So be like me just having a relationship with Brent. We talk and we can look at each other and we can kind of connect with each other. It's, it's, it's close. That's the way God wants to have a relationship with you through, through Jesus. And that's what this is all about. This is not about some kind of a religion, but it's about a relationship that Christ offers to you. I'm going to ask the team to come, and as they come, I just want you to kind of do an assessment in your relationship with God. What, where do you see God in your life right now? Is God that distant person? Is he far off somewhere, or do you feel that closeness? Is he a relatable God to you? Can, can you talk with him? Do you have that relationship? Because if you don't, today I want to give you that opportunity just to invite Jesus into your heart, into your life, to have a relationship with him. Because, see, God is a God who doesn't want to be distant from you. It doesn't matter how you feel about him. He wants to be close to you. He wants to have that relationship with you. A relationship that is close, a relationship of love, a relationship of some kind of a, you know, you know a, an everyday kind of a thing where you can relate to him where he gives guidance and direction and help in your life. And so I'm not sure where you're at today, but I'm just going to pray for us. And through this time of prayer, I just want you to kind of breathe out a prayer and say, God, maybe I don't know exactly where you are right now. Maybe you're not as close as you want to be. And that's because of us, not him. And that's when you just say, God, I just want to completely remove all the barriers all the barriers right now that are keeping you from having that relationship with me. And then you just pray that. And I believe that when we sincerely pray that, God kind of removes those barriers and enters into those places that we have left him out of before. Let's pray together. God, today we're so grateful that this Christmas message today reminds us that you wanted to be with us. You wanted a relationship, a personal relationship with us. You're not just some God who sits proudly on a throne somewhere, wearing the royal robes and this crown, just kind of controlling things and barking out orders. No, you're a God who left all of that behind to come into this world because you wanted to relate to us. 
And so God, in that, in that process of the incarnation, we're so grateful that you came close to us, but the problem is many of us still feel very distant from you. And so right now in this moment, as we recognize the reason that you came was to have a relationship with us, we want to unbox that today. We want to unbox that gift, and we want to open everything up to our, our lives, open every part of our lives to a relationship with you, every room of our heart. And so God, if there's anyone in this room yet that has somewhere, somehow been keeping you distant, I pray that right now we would unbox that so that a full, close relationship with the living God would be ours this Christmas. We thank you for that reality. We thank you for uh, coming into our world and into our lives. God, we receive that today. We embrace that, and we give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.